not understanding what they're doing. They're trying to, they got this thing on you and they're squeezing it, trying to force air into your lungs. And uh, while they're doing all that, I'm thinking, you know, what if this is real? And this philosophy that everything belongs to me. So it's my house, my car, my wife, my kids, everything's mine. And uh, so I was living that life. And uh, I thought that was what it was expected of me. You know, I thought I was, I was good. I, I'm doing the right thing. I'm on the right track. And uh, we were getting ready to kind of get into this, this, this uh, deal that we were putting together in South Florida. And uh, I decided to go and uh, run electrical lines for a while till, till that came through. So that was supposed to happen in April. I went back to running electrical lines in October. And uh, what happened was a very simple thing. We were, uh, it was Wednesday night. You can imagine tomorrow's Thanksgiving. I'm looking forward to that four day weekend. You got Black Friday. We got a lot of stuff going on. And the issue I'm having is that we're running late. And it's, it's dark. It's getting, it's going to get dark soon. And we, but we got to finish. So I'm up on the bucket. And uh, what we decided to do to save time was this I have this bucket going up and down. You kind of manage from one point to the other. And uh, anyway, wasn't the brightest idea. So nothing exotic happened. I didn't get electrocuted or anything, but uh, the driver was looking up, making sure that he didn't fry me. And he kind of bumped into a tree and I hit the side of the bucket and I broke all the ribs on my right side. So the whole side just, uh, all my ribs broke. Go to hospital, of course. And uh, they tape you up. They give you this medication. And they gave me medication that uh, because of the ribs and everything that were broken, they wanted to give me something that had an anti-inflammatory component in it. So they gave me a painkiller that had ibuprofen. Now, I take the pill in the hospital. They send me home. I go home. And I'm finding it very difficult to breathe. And I'm like, man, you know, let me call up. So I call them up. And I spoke with the uh, ER guy, and he says, ah, you're all taped up. You can't take a deep breath anyway, so you're okay. You know, it, it, it's, it's just that. Uh, so I said, all right. You know, and being science-minded myself, I said, well, they know what they're talking about, right? So I continued to take this medication, and my breathing slowly started to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And ultimately what happens is I get past the holidays, Past New Year's, and this was an interesting New Year's because it was that Y2K thing where they thought everything was going to collapse and everything mm -hmm. was going crazy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was like a, a vigil, right? Let's see what happens first when it hits midnight all the way over there first. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, I got past all that, and uh, I just got to the point where I couldn't breathe at all. And uh, it was January 5th. And I had my wife and my son take me to the hospital. And I went in the ER and I went into the, uh, you know, put me in a room. Uh, they decided they were going to keep me. So I said to my wife and son, ah, you guys go home. I'm going to be okay. There's nothing to worry about, right? It's just a little whatever. Uh, anyway, they hooked up some IVs and the nurse said to me, you know, Jose, if you need any help, Put that little button that's by your bed, and and I'll 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 come in and I'll check on you. Anyway, she leaves the room, and I remember looking at the clock, and it's like uh, 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning now. And I'm saying I'm not gonna push that button. I'm a guy. I'm just tough guy, right? I'm not gonna <laughs> push this button no matter what. So don't worry about it. But. The reason I'm saying that to myself is because I'm actually thinking of pushing that button because it's so hard to breathe. 
So I'm trying to kind of like make myself feel like everything's okay. I'm pretending everything's fine. I wait about 45 minutes and uh, I can't barely breathe. And I said, you know what? I think I better push this button. So I pushed that button. And it took about one minute for that nurse to come into that room. But that minute felt like forever. And she opened the door and she just looked at me. And she just hit that cold blue button on the wall. Now, in my mind, I'm saying, did she just hit that cold blue button on the wall? And then you hear the cold blue, cold blue. And all of a sudden, there's a bunch of people running into the room. I can't breathe at all. So I can't get air out. I can't get air in. I'm going to explain to you what, what I felt. Right? So the first feeling that I had, if you can believe, was shame. And I became, felt the shame simply because... When they moved into that room, they just stripped me down. They took the shield off of me, and I was trying to hang on to it. And I was so ashamed that they stripped me down like that, and I was helpless, and I couldn't stop it. And they take this piece of a board, and they slip it under you, and they put you on top of this board. And, and anyway, there's all this stuff going on, but I'm kind of like in my own space, right? I'm kind of like not understanding what they're doing. They're trying to... They got this thing on you and they're squeezing it, trying to force air into your lungs. And uh, while they're doing all that, I'm thinking, you know, what if this is real? Right? What if this is real? And I started thinking about my family and I'm saying, I'm not going to see them again if this is real. And I felt this knot in my chest, like emotional knot. And it was like I was dying, thinking that I would never see them again. And what was worse was that they wouldn't get a chance to see me. I wouldn't be able to say anything. Now, I couldn't talk anyway because I couldn't breathe. But in your head, that's not relevant. You're like, right. <laughs> If they get here, I'll, I'll be able to talk. I'll be able to say goodbye or whatever, right? But anyway, and I also realized that it was almost 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's no way they're going to be able to get here in time. So I, I started to free fall emotionally and crash. And I became incredibly fearful. Now, understanding that I grew up in the South Bronx and, and how I grew up, we were not allowed to show fear. We were not allowed to cry, right? <laughs> so I am so scared here because I'm thinking, what if this is real? And then I just want somebody to hold my hand. That's what I want. Just hold my hand. I don't care who does it. And I... I wanted to ask someone, but then my head got in the way, right? And I'm thinking, all right. My father had died five years before. And he's going to turn in his grave if he sees that I'm showing these people fear. <laughs> wow. And that was my thought, man. I was like, it went I deep. Can't show fear. It went deep. Dude, it went to the point where I just, my body actually stiffened and I say, that's it. Wow. I'm not going to show fear. And I, I still wanted somebody to hold my hand because I felt so alone. Now, the room is full of people, but I felt so alone. And uh, then I start thinking, uh, I didn't believe in God. I was very science-minded, very math-minded, right? And uh, I had a conflict. My mother was Catholic. My father was indigenous. My mother said, go find God in church. My father said, look out the window. God is everywhere, right? And God would be creator. But anyway, so I kind of chose a path of science. So I was really struggling with that issue. And now I'm finding myself at this point where what if something happens here? This is real. Where am I going to hang this hat? I got, I don't believe in life after death. I don't believe in anything. What's going to happen to me? That 
fear that I felt at that moment was incredibly compelling. And I started asking myself, well, what if God is real? What if God is real? Mm -hmm. And if God is real, maybe he could get me out of this mess. Because you, right? you always find God when, when the fit hits the shan. Exactly. Never when things are going well. Jesus doesn't no. show up when you're living, you're living the life. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'm, I'm, check this out. So I'm like, God, if you're real, I promise I'm going to change. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be a good man. I'm going to be whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I was almost like bargaining. Of course. And then I waited. I said, all right, let's see if there's an intervention. Meantime, these guys are really struggling to keep me going. I can't breathe at all. Uh, the, my heart becomes very regular. So imagine they're pumping with all these drugs to get me to breathe and my heart is racing. And uh, what happens is that it reaches a moment where my heart just felt like a horse was galloping. Like, bah, bah, I was going crazy. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I know is you feel your heart stop. And then to kind of like validate that that just happened, you hear the thing that was going, beep, 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 just go beep. And the thing is that I was totally conscious and aware, and I'm saying that just didn't happen. And my response was, I became angry at God. And I said, I knew you weren't real. What was I doing? I was just fooling myself. And then I looked at the door, the doorway, which was right in front of me. And it, it was just so bright, man. And there was a shadow there. And in my mind, I'm thinking, like an engineer, I'm going to get turned off like a light switch and I'm going to turn to nothing. I'm just blackness. And then I started to... to you know, that macho Latino stuff came back, right? And I'm, I'm like, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. There's no shame in this, right? All the things I was taught, I can't quit. I can't stop. If I fall down, I got to get up. And that just was right there. And I told myself, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. But there's nothing I could do to change this outcome. So Alex, I just said to myself, you know what? It's okay to die. And I started thinking how difficult my life had been. Mm -hmm. And I said, it was a hard life. I did the best I could, right? And it's, it's okay for me to kind of lay up, close my eyes. But the minute that thought goes through my mind, that shadow enters the room. And it reaches out. So to me, it's perfectly clear. While that's happening, I hear the IB drips. And it sounds like water splashing on a tin roof, you know, when you're in the island and you hear that cha cha. So like rain hitting a tin roof. And then I looked at the wall and the wallpaper, I could see the grain in it. Now, I was curious about that, incredibly enough, despite everything that was happening. Kind of like, wow, what, what is this? Then my focus was on the shadow. And as the shadow moved in, she kind of reached out. It felt like a feminine energy to me. She kind of reached out. And she touched me. And the minute she touched me, I became like galvanized. I was like, oh, man. I felt so well. I felt so unsick. I felt so, you know, better than ever. No pain. And I felt this breeze and the sense of peace and love and calm. And I'm, I got this wind blowing. In my head, I'm thinking, ah, I got this long hair, it's blowing in the wind. And, um, you know, you get crazy vision. <laughs> so I feel like I'm being lifted. And lifted. And the next thing I know, I'm standing in the corner of the room. This is what really changed my life. It was this moment 
when I saw myself there in the bed. And these guys were trying to save my life. So you got that crash team. Dude. Bah, bah. They're doing everything they can to save me. And I said to myself, that's me. And I'm dead. And then I asked this question. And this is a question that changed my life. But if that's me, then who am I? And that question, every day I ask, who am I? Because I know I'm not this. It's a temporary. So I ask that question and I hear this voice, my left side. She says to me, visualize yourself as a car. Except that that car has 5 million miles on it. Now you got to say, goodbye to your body. And I'm thinking, wow, I just said goodbye to life. I got to say goodbye to my body. And Alex, I think something magical happened. I looked at my body, and for the first time in my life, I had so much gratitude and love for that vessel. And the thought was, that body sacrificed itself for me. It gave everything it had for me, and it just didn't have anything left. Oh. And then I started having these memories and I call them benign memories because they weren't like, you know, we think about these dramatic moments in our life and that's what we're going to remember. That's not what I remember at all. I remember holding my little brother's hand, little kiss, taking a breath of air, the sunrise, the wind, the bird singing. I remember looking in my kids' eyes when they were little and how they looked at me with so much love and how they depend on you so much, right? And what I realized at that moment was that I had that every moment of my life. And I never know. Rarely did I get into that moment. And yeah, I got my guys here, my kids, and, and, and love that moment. Feel that breath. Feel that warm sun on my skin. And, and here I am understanding the value of life. And it's too late. I'm understanding that I have all these things and they're all free. Mm. They don't come with any cost, with any hopes, nothing. And I was worried about buying another car, getting a, 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 a better coffee machine, getting, you know, all these crazy things. And I'm like, what was I doing? But it made me love who I had been. And that, for, for everybody out there, this is really important. I always was never happy with who I was. I was never good enough. No matter what. And that made my life difficult. And now looking at my body and seeing how perfect that body had been for the first time. Saying, man, feeling all this gratitude for it and love. It it was the second moment where I just was changed. I hear the voice say to me, okay, now we got we to gotta go. Kind of like, so we start walking together. And I kind of fall through this hole, this black hole, I call it, the tunnel. And I feel like something being ripped off of me. It's a little uncomfortable. Get to the bottom. She says, no, we got to keep going. I keep going. The same thing happens again. Then when I get to the bottom of that, I find myself in a bowl. So it's color all around me, like 360. You know, I think, it, imagine you're in the, in, in the center of a basketball and everything around you is color and it's moving and it's alive. And it's talking to me. A million voices. And that voice that brought me there says to me what you felt was all the painful moments in your life being taken away from you. You can't come into this place with any negativity, anything that, that makes you feel bad. And I understood that I was just being kind of like purified. Anyway, I feel the color moving towards me or I'm moving towards the color. I don't know which, but the sense is that the color 
welcomes me the way I am. It doesn't judge me in any way. I just feel so good, you know, so appreciated, so, like, welcome, and so, like, a part of it. Like, I really belong here. And finally, I get in the color, and I become the color, and I feel yellow you know, feels like it, red and blue. And I hear all these voices. And I'm not a painter, but it was telling me how to paint. Give me like a blueprint. You're going to paint like this. You're going to start with this. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And uh, gave me a blueprint. Then I come out and we call the other side. And I see this beautiful port. Now, I grew up in New York City. You know, forest and mountains are the last thing I would imagine that was going to be what I encountered. And then these herds of animals roaming around, running free. And uh, it was so beautiful. And I got a thought. I remember my kids, and I said, what's going to happen to my kids? And the voice said to me, not to worry. I could see them from there. The next thought was, I'm flying. And then the voice said, that's normal here. And then I started moving, exploring in my mind. And as I got near a tree, what was interesting about it was I had this experience of oneness, right? What I mean was that if I got near a tree, I became that tree. I could feel it taking nutrients from the ground. I could feel the heartbeat. It was a living being like me. If I got near a bird, the same thing. If I got near a leaf, the same thing. Even the air, the atmosphere, I could feel it living. And I got to experience all these things, even a rock. And it taught me that everything was one. Everything was interconnected. What I think doesn't have life is just it's full of the same life I am. It's made out of the same things. And as I'm kind of like integrating that, I see these mountains in front of me and I see the snow cap. And it was so galvanizing that I wanted to go up there and see what that was like. So I started heading up in that direction. I get up there and I go over it and I could see a mountaintop and the snow. It was like being in an airplane, just flying over a mountaintop. And it was so beautiful and so peaceful. And then I look to my right and I see the sun. And the sun, I don't know if it's setting or rising, but I'm looking at it as if I'm looking through a telescope and I can see the solar flares coming out of it and it was so beautiful. And I could feel that warm breeze. And I'm saying to myself, oh, this is where the warm breeze is coming from. That's what's giving me lift. That's, this is why I could fly here. And I look to my left. When I look to the left, there's a, a cove. And it's like a, a U-shaped beach. And uh, I see a man. And he's holding six children in a line on his right hand and one on the left. And they're about knee deep in the water. And for some reason, I said, let me go down there and check that out. Right? So I go down. And it's hard to gauge time and distance. There is really no time the way we understand it here. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I had been there for a day and a half already. Now, I'm only dead for five minutes in, in this world. Anyway, as I get close, I'm about 10 or 15 feet away, maybe a, a man turns around. He looks at me. And Alex, that was uh, my father. And I looked at my dad and I said, man, I'm going to do when I'm dead what I couldn't do when I was alive. I told my father I love him that I care and all that stuff. Now, my dad had this real image of being a man was like, we can't hug. We don't say we love each other. We don't, we don't, we don't have that kind of relationship, right? We don't, you know, 
we don't even hold hands. You were only little, you know, that was what your mother does. Your mother does all that. So I never hugged my dad. And I never, ever said to my father I loved him. And the thing is, I don't remember him telling me that either. So I grew up bitter and angry. And when he died, it was so difficult for me because everything that I'm feeling right now, that I'm talking about, I couldn't tell it to him anymore. That chance was gone. I lost that moment. But now here I was. And now the moment was here again. I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship. Taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. To watch the entire interview of this near-death experience, click on the video below and don't forget to subscribe.